It's an incredibly exciting time to have you here. There's so much going on in the uh, auto industry. And before we delve into sort of the trends within that um, and uh, potentially your, your personal career and the leadership that you've shown, uh, it'd be great to, to look at the space as a whole. And um, it, it seems at the moment there's a sort of existential threat where the need and indeed the desire to own cars is, is, is coming down. How do you lead such a huge, iconic company in that context? Well, I think, you know, we, obviously we do a lot of research to understand what's happening. We're, we're definitely seeing people are deciding to buy vehicles later, depending on where they live. Um, and and it's, it's a, if you put the customer in the center of how you look at this, it doesn't surprise me that if you're in New York City and you pay a lot of money for a car, you pay a lot of money to park it, when you get it out to drive it, you're in stop and go traffic, when you get to where you want to go, you're going to pay a lot of money to park it if you can find a place. And so you start to look at all of those as customer pain points. And you start to say, people are still going to need to move from point A to point B, but depending on if they're in a dense urban environment, uh, uh, you know, what are they going to need to travel with them? You know, are they a single individual? Are they, you know, do they have three children and a pack and play? I mean, so I think we try to look at it to say, let's really understand the customer. And let's understand how we can create value for them and how we can provide new experiences that are better for them. And you know, that kind of drives us on how we make decisions about what we invest in and you know, different concepts of you know, why we did the alliance with Lyft, why we bought cruise automation, why we started our own car sharing program, Maven. It's all with this intent to make sure that we're looking and saying, how do we provide the most value for the customer as they get from point A to point B? Right, and in and, and, and these times of, of sort of quick change, presumably that requires a change of behavior equally at, at General Motors. And um, you know, it, it's uh, over 100 years old, over 200,000 employees. I'm, I'm sure you know these stats. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but more seriously, historically, the focus has been on a long product cycle, on lean mm -hmm. operations, not on taking risks, on iterating quickly. As we move from a, a hardware-centric world to a, a more software-focused one, how do you how do you change the behavior to become more dynamic, more entrepreneurial? Well, you're, you make a really good point, and we've invested a lot of time in that. One of the you know people have this hundred-year-old view of General Motors, and you know one of the stats that I throw out that usually surprises people is almost forty percent of the employees, the the salaried workforce, has been with the company less than five years. And so we are you know there's a lot of new talent that has come to the company as we've done that. We've you know, kind of mix, remixed the shift of there used to be a lot of people who worked on body structures, and now we have a lot more software engineers in the technical area. So you know, we've uh, really managed uh, how we shift the skill set of the organization, because even if you take the traditional car, 10 years ago, when you look at a car, you know, it had a radio, maybe had some systems on it. But now, every vehicle we make, even, you know, I'll say the most base vehicle, has tens of millions of lines of cone in it. So we've been making that shift and, and have a lot of new talent that has come to the company. But then the second part of your question is, you know, we're a, a, a long development cycle. If you start from, uh, you know, from a blank uh, computer screen, not a piece of paper, you're really going to be on a four to five year development plan to put a new car into the marketplace. But when we're doing a Maven, uh, a new offering for Maven, it's on a week cycle. You know, it's how quickly do you, soft you create the software to, to add the new functionality to the app. And so we've really had to challenge ourselves uh, to know when we need to move at a vehicle development cycle because in our business, um, you know, the average age of a car is 11.4, uh, I think it's over 11.4 years. So we're making a product that's going to be on the road for a very long time um, and has to be, you know, safety is, a, is an overriding priority with that. But yet, uh, in different aspects of our business now, it's really, you know, what is the minimum viable product to put forward that will really start to add value. So we have to be working, we talk about working at both speeds. Uh, one of the great things was um, acquiring cruise automation. Because what we've done with Cruise, and we've now given them responsibility not only to develop the, um, the artificial intelligence or the specific software for autonomous, you know, linked into the major technical uh, resources of the company, but we've also given them the responsibility for commercialization. And we have, a, I'll say, a very thin line of a handful of people that they go to when they want to you know, uh, leverage the vast resources of General Motors, there's like a pretty hard wall with the, the 
big company wanting to go into the startup because we don't want to overwhelm them with help and slow them down. And so it's really allowed us to kind of learn at, I'll say at startup speed, how to run a major, you know, major initiative, a very important, uh, uh, you know, program that we're working on from an autonomous driving perspective. And we're able to start to infuse that type of thinking into the broader organization. So, you know, the added benefit of, of uh, acquiring Cruise was not only the wonderful technology and the talented people, but it was also just driving the whole company to work at uh, startup speed. Got it. And, and, and speaking of autonomous cars, I, I think we, we'd all acknowledge now it's, it's a matter of when, not if. Um, hmm. What should we as sort of citizens be most excited about in that transformation and what, what should we be most concerned about? I think what you should be most excited about is safety because 96%, uh, if you look at the latest statistics, 96% of all fatalities, and this is U.S. data because it's readily available, are due to human error. And so as you get into autonomous vehicles, you are going to be moving to a much safer way to, to be moving from point A to point B. Uh, so I think that's one of the most significant. It also is, you know, if done well, is more convenient, gives you time back. Uh, you can be doing other things in the vehicle, uh, having different experiences or in the, I call it a vehicle, but in the whatever we want to call what moves you from point A to point B. Um, you know, I think worried about is, I don't know if, if, if the customer is necessarily worried, but I think it's also, I wouldn't call it a worry as much as an understanding, is that for a very long time, autonomous vehicles are going to be interacting with, uh, you know, vehicles driven by humans and you know, it's going to be moving to a much safer place, but that doesn't mean that, you know, everything is going to be perfect. Nothing in life is perfect. No software program is, is infinitely perfect. And so I think understanding, um, you know, how we make that transition uh, in today's world, I think will be important that we spend some time educating, but also helping people understand what the technology is capable of and what it's not. And especially where we're going to be, for a very long time, we'll be in a world that has both. Right. And, and you, you mentioned, um the significant investment you made in, in Lyft earlier. Um, I think at one point there was even talk of, of potentially acquiring it, but what, what's the um, game plan there, and particularly given what's happened more recently, um, how do you think of, of trying to delete Uber? Well, that, that, <laughs> that, you know, that, that's Lyft's subjective, um, I would imagine. It, the way we look at it and why we did the alliance is we believe that autonomous uh, driving for an end consumer will first happen in a shared environment. Now, why is that? Uh, one is because as the vehicle, as we first put the vehicle out, A will want to own it. Um, until you know, we go through the rapid uh, cycles of, of you know, getting the sensor cost down, there's going to there's be cost. So it's going to make sense to have it in a, a shared environment. But also because um, the vehicle will start with limited capability. Right now, we're limited on how fast the vehicle can go based on how fast we can process the data coming in from the sensors. You know that will change, and that will change rapidly. So what will happen, the cost curve will go down as the capability curve goes up of you know, how does it manage a tunnel, how does it manage you know, different uh, snow and fog and all the other you know, different elements. And so um, I think that as we look at it, that's, that's why it was so important to have uh, uh, you know, an alliance and we've actually learned a lot about sh the shared, the ride sharing space through our alliance, but very important because that's where we think the first major opportunity is for autonomous vehicles. Right, so may maybe summing up all these kind of um uh, first few questions. What, what does General Motors look like in 10 years' time, 20 years' time? You know, I don't think anyone knows, but I think, uh, you know, my view and what I work hard every day to make sure is that General Motors is, is a, you know, leading the transformation. Because when I look at the assets that we have, not only the deep technical talent that of, of doing, you know, again, machines that, uh, and technology platforms that are on the roads for more than a decade, and uh, leading in how do we focus on the customer to make sure that, you know, it's not just technology because we can, but how do we solve real issues? How do we uh, make the, the world better from a, you know, a, a customer perspective, from an environmental perspective, uh, from a, a congestion perspective? And so I believe with all the assets we have, that we have a unique ability and responsibility to lead that transformation, to do it exceptionally well and, and improve the whole transportation space. Um, the political environment has also seen significant changes. Uh, a big part of um, President Trump's campaign was bringing jobs back to the U.S. 
uh, General Motors has uh, manufacturing hubs all, all over the world. Uh, you're also part of his business uh, council. Um, how do you sort of balance that, and um, how do you think about bringing all manufacturing jobs back to the U.S.? Well, I think first, um, our general philosophy is where we build, we build where we sell. And in the United States, for example, 70% uh, of the vehicles we sell in the United States are built in the United States. If we look at just total number of vehicles built here versus sold here, it approaches 80%. So we do have a lot of jobs. Uh, you know, we have over 100,000 jobs in this country alone. So part of it was making sure people understood, uh, understood our industry. We also, though, uh, you know, my responsibility is to manage the company and deploy capital in the best interest of our owners, our shareholders. And so I've got to look at that and make sure, it, it, you know, easiest thing in the world is to say, oh, I'm going to build a factory here and I'm going to bring a bunch of jobs here. But if that's not sustainable, if that wasn't the best decision for the company, uh, it's a very temporary situation. Uh, because, because you, jobs, you know, you have to have a vibrant, strong company to have job security and provide jobs over the long haul. And I, I think that's what the, the end goal is here. So, you know, we work on, you know, what, how do we make manufa manufacturing more competitive here? How do we, um, you know, take away there, across the globe, there isn't necessarily a level playing field and, and you know, what can come in versus that uh, can be exported. So there's a lot that we can work on that's gonna improve jobs, but the foundation of it has to be good business economic sense, otherwise it's not sustainable and you really haven't done it in, in the long term. It, it's not gonna do anyone, uh, any, it, it's not good for anyone. Uh, sort of looking specifically, I have one of uh, President Trump's tweets. It, it, it said, General Motors is sending Mexican-made model of Chevy Cruze uh, to U.S. car dealers tax-free across the border, uh, make in U.S. or pay big border tax. They, they never I sound as good that when too. you... <laughs> yeah, they never sound as good when you read them out. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, General Motors is, is clearly not alone in, in facing tweets uh, from President Trump. You know, given particularly the, the lack of clearly defined policy that, that we've seen, how do you, how do you react to well, a tweet like that? I think the first thing is don't overtrain on it. Because if you step back and say, okay, his message is jobs, that's pretty clear. You know, we were within, you know, I don't think it was an hour before that tweet came out, we were able to put the facts on that specific vehicle that, yes, is built in Mexico, but, you know, then it becomes the economics of building cars. We probably sell, I don't know, uh, less than 10,000 of those vehicles in the United States uh, because a, a hatch is something that, you know, it's a segment that people want, but not, you know, it's not a dominant segment. And that's true for most countries. So placing that business in Mexico with all the free trade agreements they have allows you to offer that vehicle. If you said, I can only offer it if I build it here, I wouldn't capitalize it, so it wouldn't be available. And so part of it was just explaining that, explaining that the cruise, uh, the, the cruise sedan is built in Lordstown, Michigan, and you know a factory is dedicated to it. I think that pretty much subdued that. But but I stepped back and said, okay, I'm not going to overtrain on the tweet. I'm certainly not going to get into a tweeting. <laughs> Uh, exchange. Um, let's put the facts. I don't have those yeah. tweets that you said. Yeah, I d yeah. Be, because, but but if you think about it, I step back and said, okay, what what is the real message? And let's now work constructively on what of uh, trying to create more jobs. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm really proud about at General Motors is with the hundred thousand people we employ, those are good middle class or 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 better jobs in this country. Um, and I'm really proud of the jobs that we provide. So let's look on how does it make good business sense for us to do more of that as opposed to responding to a tweet. Got it. And I guess the more formally, um, uh, lots of potential trade policy uh, coming up. Uh, is there anything that, that you're thinking will benefit uh, General Motors substantially or, or workers in the Rust Belt? Um, you know, I think workers across the country, uh, but I think getting a level playing field. I mean, I think that's all we can really ask. We shouldn't ask for advantage, uh, you know, that is artificial. The, the, again, my opinion, let's, let's have an a equal playing field and then, you know, I can create more jobs if I sell more vehicles, if I, you know, make more vehicles here that I can export because it's not a 10, 20, or 30 percent tax as, they, as they're sent to another country. I mean, our, our main message is a level playing field and then let us compete and, and we're, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll bet on us. Got it. And then we, um, we saw that um, some CEOs, so Travis from, from Uber, obviously chose not to be part of that business council in the end after a reaction from, from their user base. Was that something that crossed your mind as well, given 
um, with, with parts of your customers. It, it's an unpopular administration. Um, you know, first of all, it's our it's our administration. You know, we may I have voted in many elections, and there's been times. You know, the candidate I voted for was elected, and there's been times that candidate hasn't been. But it then is our government, and so when you're asked to serve, and you know, with as important as our industry is to the country, and 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 jobs, and and what we do, to not take the seat at the table if it's offered to you. Um, I just think is is a missed opportunity, and so when I represent the company and and to have that voice uh, into the government, I think is vitally important, and I think it's proven to be very important for us to communicate uh, a very complex supply chain as it related to the border tax initially when those conversations, or the fact that there wasn't a level playing field across many countries that can uh, send vehicles here with no with no tax or. Uh, to talk about job creation and job training and you know there's just been a whole host of issues that we've been able to have a strong voice into it so to miss that opportunity um, I, I wouldn't consider that and, and you mentioned uh, ha having a seat at the table would mm -hmm. you uh, ever consider uh, a more permanent seat at the table um, <laughs> I, think I, I think I just answered that question about a week and a half ago but now you know, I've been at General Motors for 37 years it, uh, there's just so many exciting things we're working on with transforming the industry uh, that that's where my heart is, that's where my passion is, and that's where, I'll, where I will work. And I think I can contribute to, uh, if, we, if we execute what we're, what we're working on, I think that we can really contribute to the country and, and to the globe because we do business in many countries. So I, I, think, uh, I think that's where I belong. That makes sense, okay. I will, uh, I'll, I'll change my track. Uh, <laughs> um, so, one of the other things is, is um, you're obviously w widely considered as one of the faces of um, successful women in business. Um, there sometimes uh, appears to be an expectation that that will therefore make you a champion of, of women in the workplace. Is that uh, is that ever something that's frustrating, or how, how do you how do you handle that? Well, I, I guess I'd like to be a champion of people in the workplace because um, I, I believe fundamentally that you when you you know you'll have. Uh, Create the best experience, have the best results when you engage the hearts and minds of your of your people. Um, so, I mean, that's the way I look at it. Is there, you know, clearly, if I can be a role model for young women to want to pursue a career in STEM, which I think is so vitally important, uh, or for them to say, I'm going to aspire to do this because I, I've seen her and she did it, so why can't I? And if I can provide that role model, I, you know, that, that makes me extremely happy. I, I had, uh, in my first year in the job, I had somebody come up to me and said, because of you, my daughter has chosen to study engineering. And it was like one of the best comments you could get. Um, and so, you know, for sure, that, that is very meaningful. At General Motors, uh, because, you know, you can't say, diversity is so vitally important for the success of our company. And it's not something that you can say, well, I did it and it's done. It's something you continually work on. I champion a group of the most senior women, so the top 35 women in the company. Um, but it's really, for me, it's getting them to say, okay, you know, don't come to me and tell me everything that's wrong. You're a senior person in this company. Go, go tell me how you're gonna solve these problems and what you're going to do to make it better. And you know, we now meet um, three to four times a year and work on what are some of the issues with women in, in diversity. Because what I found early in my career as I worked on diversity is generally a lot of times when you solve issues for women, you solve issues for everyone. Because a lot of times men have the same issues or uh, you know, if it's a minority issue or whatever it is, a lot of it can, it can get solved with, with solving the women, the issue that's termed the woman's issue. And so um, I'm dedicated to that. But um, but I also believe you know it's it's you want to win the hearts and minds of your entire team. Got it. And um, if we now look back to sort of um, the, the start of your career, um, you came through as a, as a co-op student with with General Motors, then spent um, thirty seven years rising to the top. Uh, a lot of us now, I think, would uh, don't expect to have such a long term career at one company. Um, what would be your advice for us in considering that? And, and if you're reviewing CV or sorry resumes now, um, how do you think about someone that's maybe got a wider breadth of knowledge versus a, a depth of knowledge, and someone that stayed in, in one place for a longer time? Well, you know, I, I, you need people who have breadth and depth, depending on what the role is. So I look for that. I don't necessarily look and say, um, oh, this person's been at four companies and this person's been at one. I, I, I want to sometimes understand uh, because. 
if, if the person's been at four companies, why did they leave? And a lot of times they leave for very good reasons. Sometimes they, you know, if you get to a point where, well, I had an issue here, then I had the same issue here, and I had the same issue here, and I had the same issue here, maybe you're the issue. Um, and so, you, you know, I kind of want to probe a little on that. But beyond that, um, it, it, that's not important to me. It's really what the skills and abilities and, and experiences that they bring and the leadership that they bring. Um, you know, I've been at General Motors for 37 years. I, I wouldn't say when I started and graduated as a co-op student that I was going to be here. I, I didn't have this plan, oh, I will be at General Motors for 37 years. I kept having great experiences put in front of me. They sent me here. You know, we were just talking in the back that when I first came back from the business school, there had been a lot of change and turmoil, and I didn't have the best job. And, um, I, you know, it wasn't one of those that I was passionate about. And, you know, fortunately, in, a, in about a year's period of time, uh, and, and especially by two, the situation changed and I, I chose to stay. So I always believe in your career, life's too short to work for a company or be in a position that you don't love. Um, now, you know, work is work. I had this funny um, uh, text from my nephew um, who's now graduating from a BBA in business school at Michigan and it was his first job and he texted me. You know, I'm, I'm sitting at a computer and I've got to do all this work in spreadsheets. And I, and you know, so this, you know, it kind of was like, this isn't much fun. I said, yeah, that's why they call it work. Um, and it's just, you know, you're going to have to work and not every day's, you know, you're, you can't measure your career on every day. But if you find yourself after six months, after a year that, you know, work is not challenging or you don't enjoy it or you're not energized by it, you should probably find something else to do, again, because life's too short. I am fortunate after 37 years, and, and again, it wasn't always just a straight line. There were ups and downs in that curve, but I've been offered tremendous opportunities, which you can have at a big company like a company like General Motors. You know, to be, have worked in communications and HR and run an assembly plant and you know, machinery, you know, le led the machinery and equipment purchase for the globe and product development. I mean, I, I've just I feel like I've had a bunch of careers, and they just all happen to have been at General Motors. Right, and, um, so having had two years um, at, at the GSB um, and sort of enjoyed the life in California, the transition back to Detroit, was that, um, <laughs> was, was that an easy one? And, and I guess as, as graduates again here, um, Detroit is probably not one of the places that a lot of us are looking for work. How do you, um, how do you, how do you think about that now? What are, what are the positives we're missing about uh, Detroit? Uh, well. <laughs> There's so many. Well, first of all, it was easy for me to go back home because that's where my husband was. So, and that's where my family was. And I'm a pretty family-oriented person. So, you know, if I had been, if General Motors had said, "Hey, you could stay here," I probably would have said, "Well, unless my husband's coming here, I want to go there." But again, family-oriented person at the time. You know, my parents were there, and so that wasn't that hard a decision. Now, you know, I have to admit, every, one of the reasons I love being on the Stanford Advisory Board for the GSB as well as the, the Board of Trustees, um, I love the Bay Area. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, and Glenn may remember this, when we designed, we actually do a, a, a program, a custom program for our top leadership, and we're in our third, uh, I think completing our third cohort now. It's a, a program that runs through a year with four different weeks, and when I first came to the school, I said, I, you know, uh, Silicon Valley doesn't have the, or you know, Palo Alto, you don't have the lock on innovation and creativity, and I want to infuse that back in, into the company actually across the globe, and that was the kind of the start of designing the program that we did around design thinking and leadership, and it's actually one of the most popular classes that um, training, it's not a class, it's a development program, it's probably of all time, so it's, it's something that has worked out exceptionally well. So, you know, it's, it's a beautiful climate, there's a lot of energy here, but what Detroit is different. Detroit, you have seasons. You have, um, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, and I, uh, my mother used to say that too. But I, I, I do say, just to be to totally honest, I said ever since I spent two years out here, I think my blood thin because I'm always cold when it's winter. If it's below 60, it's just cold. Um, however, said so that I do enjoy, you know, it's a, it is a different climate. It's, and, you know, the Midwest is a different type of, of community. And uh, that's where I've grown up, so that's home for me, and so I do enjoy it. Uh, and again, what I think is so um, interesting about Detroit right now, and again, if you don't like the cold, you're not going to be happy. I'm not going to try to put a, you know, a, a, a bow on that. Uh, but 
uh, what is really exciting right now to be in Detroit is because the city is, is going through just a complete renaissance and it's fun to be a part of that. It's fun to see the new restaurants start up and the new, uh, you know, the new um, uh, cultural things that you can do and, and, and just to be a part of how we're reinvigorating the city, the entrepreneurship, people coming to the town to watch the new buildings come up. You know, I joked about the fact that they built a Whole Foods in downtown Detroit, which five years ago people would have been like, no. Um, but they built a Whole Foods, and the, the biggest problem with the Whole Foods is the parking lot's not big enough. Because it's, you know, when you look at all the, you know, the young professionals that have come into the city, when they work all day, you know, it's, it's part of their routine. So it's really fun to be a part of a city that is, is going through this rebirth and to be a part of it. And you know the the other thing why we're drawing a lot of entrepreneurs there uh, is because it's pretty cheap to live there. So you can start a new business, you can launch something. So um, I love it here, but I love it there. That makes sense. And um, if we now go jump a little bit ahead in your your career, um, you uh, became CEO. There were other internal candidates in the running. They changed from peers to becoming people that uh, reported into you. Um, how did you handle that transition? Well, I think first of all, we had we had a strong relationship um, before. We had worked together before, and uh, I have a very collaborative leadership style. So, I want to get the best views on the table. And I think because we knew each other so well, it wasn't like I said something and then everybody froze. I, and I want people to challenge me. I'm going to you know come at an issue, and if I've got a point of view, I'm going to come at it pretty hard and be pretty convicted. But if someone presents a, a compelling counterpoint. I, I want to hear that, and so I try to make sure there's a lot of constructive tension and that all views are heard. I mean, there's times on really important decisions where I go to every single person around the table and say, what do you think? And, uh, and, and I've also done work with my senior leadership team to build trust. We, we actually do offsites two to three times a year where we go in to make sure, you know, we know how to give each other constructive negative feedback um, and, and, and have a direct conversation where I, I don't agree with you and it's not personal. But so I think because that's my style of being pretty collaborative, um, we were able to work through it pretty quickly. You know, there was a, probably a couple little, you know, where you kind of had to renegotiate what the, you know, how the relationship was going to work. But I would say, you know, a few weeks, uh, maybe a few months in, it was a, kind of a, a non-issue. Uh, and that, that um, collaborative style, is, is that um, partly because of the experience you had at the GSB as well, the, the off-sites you talked about uh, sound like some of the courses that, that we do here. Is, was that like a big part of the, the, the collaborative style that you used? You know, I think it's a good question. I mean, I learned so much here. I always say when people ask me, you know, what did you learn? I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know. I mean, I, you know, I had an engineering background. I had worked in a big company, but, you know, more in a focused area. And so it was so broadening to come here and understand the several aspects of business. So it, it's always been a foundation for me. But, you know, I think your point, it probably does root back to all those group projects you're doing now where, you know, you could probably write the paper a little faster, uh, but it wouldn't be as good because it wouldn't, in, you know, be fusing together four views or having those debates about what's better. And I, I think you're right. I think at... It, it, there's val it takes more time, but in the end, you get, I think, a much better answer that you can then execute. Because the other thing is, you, once you, you go through that uh, process of, of debating, everybody's on board. If, you, you know, if, you're, if you're doing it well, you get everyone on board, and then you execute a lot faster. Makes sense. And um, then right at the, the time that you did become CEO, um, you had to immediately handle the uh, faulty ignition switch crisis. Um, mm -hmm. How, um, if you had been CEO before that rather than in the direct aftermath, um, was there anything that, that you could have done differently um, or any changes that you could have made to, to avoid it? You know, clearly, if we had known about it sooner, we could have uh, made uh, better decisions. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I think is not well known from the way that it was covered in the media was. This, this was an issue that was unfortunate that over a long period of time mistakes were made, but it was the internal company, you know, and, and the, actually the team who finally figured out what was happening and brought the issue forward and we decided to do the recall. So, but clearly there were a lot of mistakes made along the way. And, you know, I don't know, I, the minute we found out about it, we acted. 
Um, and the minute we knew, you know, we, we were guided by three principles of doing the right thing for the customer, being transparent, and doing everything in our power to make sure it never happened again, which meant changing a lot of processes and, and the way work was done. And so I, I think it's one of those things you, you don't get to choose when you have a crisis. When you have it, uh, you know, you have to deal with it then and, and you, you don't get to put it off and say, well, I'll deal with that next month. You, you deal with it now because that's just the way the world works. And, and throughout that time, you, you made a significant effort to um, rebuild uh, General Motors' images, uh, image um, with you know, increased number of public appearances and so on. Um, how, did, how did you consider trying to be proactive versus reactive in that time of crisis? I think you have to be proactive because, if, you know, especially with how fast communications happen today, if you don't tell, you know, if you don't get the facts out on the table, that void will be filled with misinformation. And so we felt it was very important. That's why you know transparency was one of the kind of the guiding principles we used to make sure we were we were being updated. At the same time, you can't answer questions you don't know the answer to. And so there were times where I had to say I don't know, and you know I was criticized for that when I went to Congress, and you know even made fun of on Saturday Night Live. But um, that was that's a fun thing to wake up to. Um, but. <laughs> And my brother calling me, Mary, Mary. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, you don't really. You you have to. You have to tell the story, and you have to answer the questions when you know the answer. One of the things, and, and I encourage all of you, because you're so tempted because you think you know what happened. Until you know what happened, you can't answer. Had I done that, I would have answered wrong, and I would have probably caused a lot more harm to the company. So you know you want to you want to get to the facts as quickly as you can, but if you don't have facts, you can't you know it's this this racing because you've got to move as fast as you can, but you have to do it with facts. And and for me that the way I, I worked on that was to have a cross functional team that had you know kind of had oh here's the engineering view and the finance view and the legal view and the communications view and the you know the customer sales view. Let's all get in a room and let's figure out what are we all hearing, what do we need to do, what are the facts, are you sure? Okay, now we're going to move. Um, and now as you, you look back uh, sort of over your career, I, one of the, the quotes I, I saw um, as we were preparing for this was, was that you've never asked for a, a raise. Um, and if you were now at the start of that career journey, would you think about that differently? You know, I, I, I guess the way I look at it, it, it kind of gets back to what I said before. If you don't love your job, if you, know, if you don't think whether it's you don't think you're being fairly compensated or challenged or it's not a fulfilling job, you need to act on that. I think I found through my career, pay wasn't one of the issues that I had. Um, it had I, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't saying never do it. I'm just saying I found myself in a position where there were times I had to ask for saying, "Hey, I know this is my job now, and I'm, you know, I'm going to do this really well. But here, my here are where my interests are, and I'd like to, you know, be have the opportunity to be considered for roles in this area. I think that's your obligation, and and I, you know, I did proactively uh, advocate for myself in those types of situations. I just never had an issue where I thought I wasn't being fairly compensated. Got it. Um, and, and final question for me now before we open up to, to the audience. Um, also, as part of the research, uh, we read about um, your sort of never happier than actually on the test track, putting the cars through the paces. Um, is there anything else we would be potentially surprised to, to know about? <laughs> Probably, <laughs> but you no. Know, I just from a work perspective, um, you know. Again, uh, I people say, "Why did you stay at General Motors so long?" You know, there is something about the auto industry, and there's been a couple times now where we've had people leave the industry and come back, and when they when they you know, I'm interviewing, I'll say, "So why do you want to come back?" And they'll be because I miss it, because there is something. Uh, there's just an excitement about you know building cars or trucks or crossovers and you know people name them and they write songs about them and they pick it because you know this fits my personality or this fits my functionality but you know for a lot of people a car is kind of an extension of themselves and it's fun to be in that business um, and then you know doing you know we're I, I feel like we're you know we're in the technology business we're in the fashion business and so I just, I love, I love the industry. And I always say my best days are either spending time at design staff, because then you're looking at what is the next generation of this, or what is an all new vehicle in this segment going to be. And you know, the, I, you know, the minute I see it, I'm like, oh, you know, wait, why is that two years out? I want it now. Um, or you know, getting to spend time in our Milford Proving Grounds or some of the test tracks we have around the world and, and driving our vehicles. And you know, 
when I was running product development, every Friday afternoon, we'd go out to the to our proving grounds and we'd drive our new cars or cars that were under development. We'd drive it against the competition and we'd spend the afternoon um, and it was, it, it's, it's what we do. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Amazing. Um, well, at this point, I'll um, look to my colleagues. Hi, my name is Maureen Gage Capello, and I'm an MBA two here. Um, we talk a lot about culture at Stanford, and I wonder for you, um, you're kind of leading GM through this merger of cultures of an automotive world that is kind of slower returns, longer cycles, um, a lot of capital, versus like this technology innovation cycle of high returns, quick innovation. And I'm curious how you think about leading a company through that and merging those two cultures together. Yeah, I, I think it, it's one of the ways to do that is you um, to bring in talent. You know, we brought in a lot of talent who, you know, we had a lot of talent who understood the the vehicle development cycle that you talked about, the longer capital intensive cycle. But really, to do it quickly, you had to bring people in, uh, and you had to get them in the room and and get them, you know. Uh, debating it and coming up with the right answer uh, because you can do certain things and especially in the vehicle you know when you look at all the things you can do in a vehicle now of connecting your phone and and all that that different technology or you know just the different functionality better word that you can do in a car now that you couldn't do five or ten years ago but how that works be you know how you're technically doing that and still protecting the braking and the steering system but providing all this functionality is and, and most people don't understand they'll be like well why can't i control this well you know that's pretty uh, core to the the engine performance type of thing so um, but getting getting the two mindsets in the room and coming up with the winning solution is the best way to do it fast i've found uh, and, and then just, you know, from a culture perspective, to me, when I look at culture, it's about behaviors. So when people ask me, you know, what are you most worried about? I'm confident we have good answers, but will we get them to market fast enough? And so constantly reemphasizing the speed, but yet, you know, you have to, you can't, you, you, sometimes an organization, especially an engineering organization, will take you so literally that you have to make sure that you're talking about safety and, you know, um, you know, one of the things we always say, we want results, but we want them with integrity. And so it, it's really, to me, talking a lot about behaviors, but when you're trying to blend two very different worlds, you know, it, it's pretty hard to take this person and, and, or this person and, and switch them and, and have that be successful. But you put them together and they can be really powerful. Uh, Jim Phelps, uh MBA 79. <laughs> no cane, no walker. <laughs> uh, going back to the uh, uh, breath versus depth conversation that you had a while back, uh, I wonder if you might be able to comment on the increasing push at both the undergraduate and graduate level to focus be more capable the moment you come out. Commit and pick majors earlier. In graduate school, uh, get concentrations that are, that are uh, more finely tuned. And contrast that with the recent comments by Sam Palmasano, the recently retired uh, chairman and head of uh, another technical company, IBM, <clears throat> that he says, I think we have a need for more breadth um, for people that can communicate, can be cross-disciplinary. How do you see that working out at uh, a firm like GM? And what can you say to the student body that's facing these sorts of uh, questions right now? You know, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, again, from a company perspective, I need people who have tremendous depth. You know, if you're a chief engineer of a vehicle, that's generally, by the time you get to be a chief, you've been in that vehicle development, you know, being a, on, a, on a product program for about 15 years because the cycles of learning, really being able to make all the decisions to integrate every single system in the vehicle, uh, the way we do it, it's a really small team that is the chief engineer and then the, you know, the, the electrical group and the powertrain group and the body structures group and the, you know, the infotainment, they're all coming together, but they're the ones who've got to make those trade-offs. So, you know, and there's certain areas where we just need tremendous stop. Um, but, you know, for so, and then there's areas where you need somebody to say, yeah, I understand this, but I do need the breath because you need to make the trade-off. So it's, it's kind of, you need to make the trade-offs this way or this way. That's why I say you need both. 
Um, and I'm going to answer the, the second part of it as a mom, though. I mean, so I have a sophomore in college and a high school senior, and I just, you know, we are just asking, I, I, I go back, and not that we can go back to when I was a kid, uh, but, you know, how can you know when you're 16 years old exactly what you want to do for the rest of your life? I mean, I'm not sure I know what I want to do at age 55 for the rest of my life. And so to, to make, you know, so I think there's a need to, you know, if you're studying engineering, to still have some broadening classes and some, you know, some from a, uh, from a liberal arts perspective or, you know, the, 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 the liberal arts school or to understand philosophy. I think it makes you a better engineer. So this, you know, I'm only going to do this and I'm going to focus and I'm going to be the best person on this one technology. Um, especially, it's one thing if you make that decision, you know, in, in once you get into your career. I remember one of the most valued people when I was running the manufacturing engineering group was my welding expert. And, and he had spent his career becoming a welding expert, you know, and, and, and grew into that role. And, and that's the kind of depth I'm talking about you need. But he probably made that decision in his 30s or 40s, not at 16, 17, 18, when you're picking a, an undergraduate graduate major. So I'm a big proponent that, you know, as you're at a university to, yes, if you, if you know for sure this is what you want to do, I still think you should get some broadening classes and challenge yourself to think a little differently. If you don't know, that's okay. And then you need to take a broad sweep. So I, again, I have one child who knows exactly what he wants to do and I have another who doesn't. And I'm telling them both, I, you know, take some of those classes that are going to broaden that you're not sure about because Again, I came here thinking I was kind of checking a box, and I didn't know what I didn't know. So it scares me how we're, you know, pretty soon you're going to be in middle school and have to declare a career. Um, so. uh, Christoph Meyer, MBA2. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective. So many uh, companies have entered the automotive space, including tech companies. Uh, what competitor keeps you up at night? Well, I like to describe ourselves as a tech company. Um, <laughs> Tens of millions of lines of code in every vehicle, but um, okay. Um, <laughs> so, but but to your point, um, they all scare me. It's my job to be paranoid about that. I mean, there are some incredibly. When you look at the the big players in the tra I'll say in the traditional sense that you know the uh, OEMs, they're very capable. You know whether you're talking about Asian competitors or German competitors, Korean competitors, You know, very capable. So they keep me up at night. And then you know when you look at the resources that some of the you know the apples and the Googles and and some of the startups can bring. I mean, we bought a startup because and and we made that decision. Could we have grown that talent inside? Probably. It was a heck of a lot faster to to take somebody who had been working on it a couple of years and then marry the two and and you know find the right power. So. You know, whether it's the big tech companies or the traditional OEMs or the startups, they all worry me. And that's my job to worry about all of that. Hi, uh, Alex Menke, MBA One. Um, I was curious to get your thoughts on uh, the growth of EVs, um, headwinds and tailwinds, how fast you expect them to grow, and GM's strategy within that. So from an electric vehicle perspective, I, I think it's definitely part of the, the future solution. Um, when you look at the environmental concerns, it's absolutely a must, as, as our fuel cells, and we invest heavily in both. I think EVs will come first, kind of down the learning curve. Um, you know, the growth is going to be, because we're still working on solving the, the, you know, the kind of the energy density issues around batteries and, and the cost issues, although, you know, we had tremendous learnings from our first, first generation Volt to our second generation Volt to now the Chevrolet Volt. You know, I keep seeing the, the cost and, the, and the, the cost come down and the energy density go up. So I believe we're close. In fact, General Motors, we have put out, externally said we have challenged ourselves to be the first OEM or company that has profitable electric vehicles that are affordable uh, because we believe it's so much a part of the future. It's the, the biggest um, volume is going to first be in China because they're regulating it. And you know when you look at the size of the Chinese market last year, it was 28 million new vehicles sold. Uh, whether it's 18, 19, or 20, you know, 10% of that market uh, by mandate will 10, 12, 14% will be electric or either fully EV or a plug-in hybrid. So definitely moving 
Um, you know, here there's still, you know, there's a part that's an emotional decision and then for the, the bulk of people who buy vehicles, there's a financial decision. And with low gas prices, it makes the equation even a little bit harder. Uh, but I believe you're gonna, in, you know, five years it'll be significantly more across the globe. Um, a, a lot of it does depend on fuel prices, but I, I think it's a trend that is, uh, and a very important technology that we have to continue to develop aggressively because it's so important from an environmental perspective. Hi, Mary. Um, Jeff Howe, MBA One. Um, you have a particularly vocal and um, public investor in your company right now. Um, who's indicated it's not 100% in agreement with everything GM is deciding. I was just curious to hear from you how you think about managing that dialogue um, and also how you think about shareholders uh, in the context of all stakeholders in GM. Well, I mean, shareholders are our owners, so they're vitally important. And that's why we spent so much time on this particular issue to look to see, you know, hey, is there a good idea here? Because our job is to, you know, do the best from a, for our, responsibly for our shareholders. And, you know, as we evaluated this issue, we didn't think it was in the best interest of our shareholders. And so, uh, you know, that's the real, I mean, I talk regularly to multiple shareholders. I spent, I just two days ago was in Boston meeting with several shareholders, uh, uh, you know, spent the day, and I do that quite regularly. So I think it's very important to listen to your shareholders, to understand their points of view, but at the same time, then we, you know, we have to take all that information and integrate it and then understand, because we're at the company, you know, day in and day out and understand, um, you know, maybe at a, at a level deeper because we spend 24 seven uh, on it and so you, you've got to look at what's the right decision. Let's take all that input now, let, you know, and let's understand what we're doing. Is there is there a way we can improve our strategy? Is there a different capital allocation decision we can make? Uh, we've always got to stay open to that because not every good idea is going to necessarily come from the company. So that's the way I hugely value my shareholders and uh, feel feel it's vitally important to listen to them on a very regular basis. Hi, uh, Shanya, class of 07. And also a GM shareholder. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a question about automated cars. Uh, assuming that the future includes automated cars talking to each other uh, through a uh, protocol, my question is how do you think we're going to get there? Uh, do you think the market's going to pick a winner uh, among you know, OEMs or tech companies, traditional tech companies, or do you think government's going to you know, set a standard or play a role? Well, I think if you're, if you're going to have um, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, uh, which we actually, um, you know, have a vehicle that has that capability on it now. It's pretty limited because it's it's one model. Um, I think the government has to play a role. Um, and there's already, a, a, you know, standard set and, you know, a spectrum dedicated to it. Uh, but I think what's happening, because that's a, you know, think about it, every car's got to have the technology. You've got a car, you know, the car park right now in the United States is 240 million vehicles. So, and if, you, you know, at a rate of a pretty strong market now of 17 and a half million vehicles a year, with cars out of the road, it's a long journey to have fully V to V capability. Um, although there's probably some things you can do, but then you you know of, of adding the technology to other vehicles, you know certainly. But um, so I think that's a part as we go, and it's V to V, V to I, V to V to infrastructure as well. But I think what's happening in autonomous vehicles now, because that's a longer journey. You know, you've got a lot of the car, the car's got to, you know, really to do an autonomous vehicle, you need um, to control it, you need to know three things. Precisely where am I? Uh, precisely what's happening around me? And therefore, third, what path do I take safely? And, you know, we're doing that with other technologies, but, you know, clearly the V2V and the V2I technology, I think, down the road, um, you know, ha has it to take it to an even another level of not only safety, but efficiency. But we're a ways off. Hi. Um, my name is Catherine Wyman. I'm an MBA one. Um, when you guys were talking about the roles that cars have played in American culture, it really resonated with me because I'm from Texas. And so I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about how you see the role of cars and maybe more specifically GM playing in the next generation of Americana. Well, again, if I as I as I started the conversation, I think it's our job to not say here customers the solution for you, but to listen to the customer and say, you know, what does technology enable us to do? 
uh, you know, how are cities changing? How, are, how is transportation changing? And then provide the most efficient, best, uh, you know, solution from a customer's perspective. So I think one of the key things we need to do is really understand what the technology is capable of doing. Uh, not only, and, and a whole new world opens up when you have autonomous vehicles of what do you do in the vehicle because you're still going to have the, you know, at least for a period of time, the physical, you know, time of getting from point A to point B. How do we make that more efficient? How do we make the environment, what you're able to do? I mean, there's, that's why it's so exciting right now to be in the, in the auto business or in the transportation business because there's all, you know, it's really we have to be customer driven in how we deploy the technology most efficiently because I think that's that's who wins. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Saurabh saying MSX program. Uh, when you got into GM, uh, the way I look at it, it was like starting up a 100 year old company. Uh, what were your biggest challenges when you uh, got into that role and you had to like jumpstart something that's been around for so long? Are you talking about when I became the CEO? Yes, please. Okay. You know, I had been part of the, the leadership, the senior leadership team for, a, you know, a handful of years before I had the opportunity to be the CEO. So uh, we were already working on transforming the culture, simplifying the company, eliminating bureaucracy, you know, making sure people were empowered to do their best. Um, so I had been kind of been on that journey. So a lot of it was... Um, continuing and accelerating the work that we were doing to, to you know, kind of, I'll say, push the reset button after the bankruptcy with the company. Uh, and a lot of it really gets to behavior. So if you, if you subscribe that, you know, most people come to work every day and they want to do a good job, what's getting in their way? You know, do we have an environment and a collaborative environment and the tools that are necessary so you can do your best work? Or do we, you know, is it, painful to get the most simple tasks done. And so a lot of it was just continuing to make sure that you know processes and systems were efficient and we're giving people the right tools and we're giving them the right training and then empowering them. And that's the journey we've been on, um, I would say, since even before I had the role. Uh, and continue to do that today. We you know, spend a lot of time working on what are the right behaviors, um, what are the company's values, and how do we really infuse that because you know, that, then it's, it gets to that capturing the hearts and minds of everybody that are, are going to deliver superior results. Uh, unfortunately, Mary, that is uh, all we have time for. So please uh, join me in thank you very much. Thank you all. Great questions. Thank you.